Good day. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Douglas Harder, and in this topic, we're going to do a deeper dive in the error analysis of Euler's, Hoynes, and the fourth order Runge Kutta method. In this topic, we will begin by looking at how we can actually calculate the second derivative of the solution given the ordinary differential equation. Following this, we will describe something called the Lipschitz constants. constant. This gives us a worst case scenario for the solvers of initial value problems, mostly because we are continually approximating solutions with approximations. However, we'll also discuss how this is almost likely to never happen in engineering problems. We will then comment on defining errors for initial value problems. We will then look at how we can estimate the error of Euler's, Hoyne's, and the fourth order Runge Kutta methods, and we will see how we can ensure that this error is below the required threshold. Finally, we will discuss issues with this approach and describe why we will need adaptive techniques in the subsequent lectures. Now, in the last three lectures, on Euler's, Hoynes, and the fourth order Runge Kutta method, our error analysis showed that the, if the error of a single step was h to the n, then if we applied this same algorithm or method multiple times, the error was now reduced to order h to the n minus one in each case. Now, this was based on having a similar analysis to what we saw for integration. Problem. When we were doing integration, we were assuming that each value we evaluated the integrand at was exact. So if we were integrating f, we're, regardless as to where we evaluated f, we got the value that was exact at that for that particular value. With initial value, pro value problem solvers, however, we have a serious problem. In every single case, except for the first, we always estimate yk plus one using the previous value, which itself was an estimation of that value. So we're estimating a value using an estimated value, which was estimated using another estimated value all the way back to the initial condition. Now, fortunately, the error is nevertheless still proportional to h to the n minus one, but unfortunately, the coefficient may actually end up being slightly larger than expected. So what we will do right now is we're going to do a slightly deeper dive into Euler's method, and we can assume similar results for Hoynes and fourth order Runge Kutta. Now, one question we have to ask about Euler's method is, we noted that the error depends on the second derivative evaluated at some value tau. Can we possibly estimate this? Well, first of all, recall that the first derivative is equal to this function of t and y of t, which is given. Therefore, the second derivative is the total derivative of this bivariate function f. Because it's bivariate, the actual or total derivative is the partial derivative with respect to the first variable plus the partial derivative with respect to the second variable, but because the second variable y depends on t, we must therefore use the chain rule, and consequently, that result must be multiplied by the derivative of y of t. Oh, but wait a second, we have the derivative above. That's just that function f, so we can just substitute it in. Let's look at our two examples. For example, in the first case, the ordinary differential equation is just the derivative is equal to negative y of t. 
Consequently, the derivative is the partial with respect to that previous expression with respect to t, which is 0, plus the partial with respect to y, which is negative 1, times negative y of t. All right, and that just simplifies. Oh, wait a second. The second derivative is y of t. Why is that? Right, because the solution was e to the negative t, and the second derivative of e to the negative t is e to the negative t. Alternatively, given the second ordinary differential equation, which is negative 0.2 times y of t minus sine of t minus 0.1, the second derivative can be found first by taking the partial with respect to t, which is negative cos of t, plus the partial with respect to y, which is negative 0.2. Using the chain rule, we multiply that by that expression, and consequently, expanding that, we get this expression here. All right, so. Well, at least in this case, the second derivative is bounded by t because, well, cos of t and sine of t are not going to be greater than, in this case, greater than 2 in absolute value. And so the only thing that's left is 0.04 y of t. Now, you will never be asked to apply this next slide in this course. However, a function f on a domain where t and y have values in these two intervals, a function f on that domain is said to satisfy a Lipschitz condition if f evaluated at any two y values is less than or equal to l times the difference between the two y values. All right, so given this particular function f of t and y, we note that the difference is always less than or equal to, or actually it's always equal to, 1 times that difference. So the Lipschitz constant for this first ordinary differential equation is 1. Given our second ordinary differential equation, we have that expression. We can simplify it by canceling out the terms, and that's equal to 0.2 times that difference. Therefore, the Lipschitz constant for that second ODE is 0.2. You can therefore show in mathematics that the error is larger than necessarily expected. So the error is guaranteed to be less than or equal to h times, well, you can assume that's the maximum value of the second derivative on the interval, all over 2. That sounds familiar too. But now we have the L, the Lipschitz constant in the denominator and it's multiplied by an exponential, specifically e to the l times the difference between the t value and the initial t value, all minus 1. Let's expand that and combine them together. So that gives us this expression here. Now, looking at what we have in the parentheses, uh, this part here, we notice we have a first component, which is just the difference of the most recent t value and the initial t value, plus everything else. What I'm going to do is I'm going to split that into two. All right, so I have just multiplied the constant out front by the difference and then multiply the constant by everything else. So that gives us that expression there. Now you should see something familiar. 
That's the magnitude of the error from Euler's method that we calculated. Consequently, everything else there describes the potential added error as a result of the fact that we are using an approximation to approximate the next approximation and so on and so forth. All right, so yes, we can see on the right hand side we have the difference of the t values squared then cubed and so on and so forth. So you may think this is a serious problem. However, in almost all cases in engineering, this is insignificant. Uh, mostly because most solutions engineers deal with tend to be bounded, and so the consequences are not as potentially fatal. All right, so point being, we're not going to cover this on the examination, but you as an engineer should know that while normally these techniques work very well, sometimes they can be catastrophically horrible. All right, we'll carry on. All right, so now we've discussed the worst case scenario for Euler's method. Fortunately, however, most engineering problems aren't that dangerous. The original error analysis we did is probably sufficient. So Euler's method is order H, Hoyne's method with multiple steps is H squared, and fourth order Runkuda is H to the four. Now, for all previous algorithms we've been looking at, we've also had an absolute value epsilon. That is, we required that the solution was within an epsilon of what we expect the actual solution to be. Now, we previously saw this with convergence of the root finding algorithms. So, a point was a root if the absolute value was less than this epsilon. The problem with an initial value problem solver, however, is that it's an open-ended problem. Specifically, we may not know at which point we want to stop. We may want to continue approximating the solution. Thus, we will use, instead of an absolute epsilon, we'll use an absolute epsilon per unit time. All right, so therefore, given an initial value problem and assuming we want to approximate a solution at some final t value, then we will expect that the error is less than some absolute epsilon times the difference between the final t value and the initial t value. All right, next question. Suppose that we are using Euler's method. How large should the step size be? Well, here's one approach. Consider the following strategy. Choose a value n and let y sub n, the last of these, be the value that approximates the last value we would like to approximate, y at t sub f. All right. So we find those approximations. Next, repeat this process, but now use two n intervals. So now we have twice as many approximations and just one point, just to differentiate these two, let's denote these second approximations by z sub k. Consequently, now we have twice as many z values and so z sub 2n also approximates y at the final t value. All right, so what's cool right now is that we have two different approximations of y at the final t value. Now, we are using Euler's method, and therefore the error is approximately some constant times h. Well, when we calculate the z values, we're using h over 2. So the constant is still approximately the same, not necessarily exactly the same, 
but it's still that constant, but now times h over 2. All right, I have two expressions here. So how about subtracting the second equation from the first? That gives us the equation that 0 is approximately equal to this difference because both of these are estimating y at the final t value. All right, well, rearranging that, we have that z sub 2n minus yn is just equal to c times h over 2, at least approximately. Now, what's c times h over 2? Well, if you look above, c times h over 2 is simply the error of z sub 2n. Consequently, we actually have a very good estimate as to the error of z sub 2n. Specifically, the error of z sub 2n, shown below, is just the difference between z sub 2n and y sub n. So therefore, because the error has dropped by a factor of 1 half, consequently, a good approximation of the error of the better approximation is the difference between the better approximation and the worse approximation. But not only that, we can now do something really cool. We can bring that z sub 2n on the left hand side over to the right. So now we have an even more interesting statement. Twice z sub 2n minus y sub n is actually a better approximation of y, of y at t sub f than either of the other original two values. Essentially, we're subtracting off the error that we estimated. Thus, having calculated y sub n and z sub 2n, we even have a better approximation of y at the final t value. As a bonus, you'll notice it's a weighted average. It's a weighted average of two values because 2 minus 1 is equal to 1, so it is a weighted average. And this weighted average is actually an order h squared approximation. Consequently, given our last two approximations, where y sub n is the last value in red, z sub 2n is the last value in light blue, then the difference between these two is a good approximation of the last value z sub 2n. Consequently, we can actually, for each y sub k, each of the n red approximations, make the calculation of twice z sub 2k minus that yk to get an even better approximation of y at t sub k. So now we have even better approximations of the, of the solution to the initial value problem. Thus, suppose that we want our approximation of y at the final t value to be no larger than some absolute epsilon times the difference between the final t value and the initial t value. Thus, we will do the following. First, choose an n and calculate the approximation y1 through yn. Of course, y0 is given. Then with 2n intervals, calculate the approximations from z1 through z2n. And this is with half the h value. Once again, z0 is equal to y0. Now, recall that the difference between yn and z2n is only an estimate of the error. So to be safe, we're going to be conservative. We will check if twice the difference is less than the absolute epsilon times the difference in time. All right, so if this is true, then we are finished and we can then further approximate 
y at the n additional t values with the approximations twice z sub 2k minus y sub k to improve our answer. Otherwise, repeat this process again, but do it now with 4n intervals and compare that result with the approximations with 2n intervals. Now, because this technique requires us to approximate solutions with n, then 2n, and then possibly with 4n, 8n, etc. intervals, we will call these approaches iterative solvers. We can also use this technique with Hoyne's method and the fourth order Runga Kutta method. So for Hoyne's method, we know that if we use n approximations, the error is some constant times h squared. If we double n or have h, then the error is now proportional to h squared over 4, because h over 2 all squared is h squared over 4. We can subtract these two and simplify the expression. Now we have a calculation for the difference between z sub 2n and y sub n, and that's that value there. Now that's not a value we're looking for, but if we divide both sides by 3, notice that now the left-hand side gives the error of z sub 2n. All right, so the error of z sub 2n is twice z, or z sub 2n minus y sub n all over 3. And now what we can do is we can find an even better approximation, an order h cubed approximation, by bringing the z sub 2n to the other side. So this actually cancels out the h squared error, or at least substantially so. For the fourth order Runge Kutta method, it's the same, except now it's order h to the 4. So if we double the number of points, then h over 2, all raised to the power 4, is h to the 4 over 16. Once again, we can subtract these two and isolate. Uh, but we want h squared over 16, so we'll divide both sides by 15. Consequently, the left-hand side is now a good approximation of the error for the approximation z sub 2n, that is, approximating the solution using fourth order Runga Kutta with 2n steps. Consequently, once again, we can bring the z sub 2n to the right hand side, and we actually get an even better approximation of y at the last t value. And these last two formulas, we can actually use them for each of the k values, not just the last ones. So this is nice because now we have an even better approximation than we had with either of the two original approximations. All right. This process of approximating the function at n points and then at 2n points and possibly at 4n and even 8n points does have its drawbacks. First of all, it's expensive. We're making a minimum of 3n approximations. We're also assuming that if the approximation at the last point is sufficiently accurate, then all the points will be sufficiently accurate. However, this isn't necessarily true. So if we actually want to be accurate everywhere, we may have to do a little bit more work. Also, suppose the solution is smooth at some points, but variable at others, so highly changing. 
Well, where the solution is smooth, we can probably get away with a larger step size. We don't always need to use a small step size because if the function is, if the solution is essentially flat, Hoyne's method should be a good approximation. However, wherever the solution is varying greatly, we probably require a smaller step size. The algorithm we see here, however, requires that we use the same step size everywhere, which essentially means we must now use that smaller step size at every single point on the interval from t naught to the final t value we'd like to approximate. Okay, so this is not that ideal. Consequently, in the next few lectures, we are going to look instead at adaptive techniques that allow us to dynamically vary the step size. And this is what we're looking for. We want to be able to estimate how large the step size should be so that we do not put in any more effort than we absolutely require to find our approximation of the solution. The question is, however, how do we estimate the error if we don't even know what the solution is? Well, that's what we're going to see in the next few lectures. Now, following this topic, you now first understand how to get the second derivative of the solution given the first derivative using the total derivative of the right-hand side. You are aware that the error may be more significant than our previous error estimate may suggest. However, for the most part, we don't have to worry about Lipschitz constants with initial value problems imposed by most engineering problems. So we only require that you are aware of this issue. You may likely never come across this problem in your entire life for most of you. Now, you understand also that when we are approximating solutions to initial value problems, we are now going to have an absolute epsilon which refers to the acceptable error per unit time because solving an initial value problem is an open-ended question. We may continue to forever ask what's an approximation of the next value of t. Also, because the absolute value of yn and minus twice z2n is only an approximation of the error, to be conservative will double that value. You know how to iteratively therefore estimate the error with Euler, Hoynes, and fourth order Runge Kutta, and you know how you can get an even better approximation using the two less optimal calculated approximations. Nevertheless, you know there are still issues with this approach, which is why we will next look at adaptive techniques. Here are the references, acknowledgements, the colophon, and a disclaimer. Cheers!